Um, I'm Laurie and I'm here representing Jive Mass and we have our awesome co-sponsors introduce themselves first. So welcome everyone tonight. This isn't on, so oh, it's, sorry, I'm sorry, just sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> It obviously is not doing so well. Yeah, so welcome. My name's Roy Moore and I'm the DU Black Student Alliance president and our main mission, I guess, is basically to increase solidarity amongst our black student population here at DU. And we do that through different aims, through exploring like what it means to be black at DU, exploring our stereotypes, and then also just what are the, I guess, what are the frameworks that we have that which we can empower ourselves. So, welcome. Hi, I'm Danella. Um, I'm here representing Native Student Alliance. I'm the president. Um, right now, I think our biggest mission is just working on making um, the presence of that there are actual Native Americans on this campus a bigger issue. I think a lot of people don't know that. Um, but yeah, I'm glad to see you guys come out tonight. <laughs> and my name is Adrian Nava. I'm the co-president of the Latino or Latina Student Alliance here on campus. Uh, what we do is we promote cultural awareness amongst the U and the community. Uh, we build allyships with other organizations, and we are activists in our community and outside of DU. Most notably, LSA is known for organizing the custodial staff to advocate for their rights as, as workers here on this campus. And this year, um, LSA has taken a more proactive role in addressing racial issues on campus through uh, other schools on campus and, and BSA. And so we're really excited uh, to partner with Divest so that we can all talk about why this is so important to all of us. So thank you all for coming. Well, and a little bit about Divest to you. Um, we are a student movement on campus um, organizing around the urgency of the climate crisis and urging our administration to divest its endowment from fossil fuels. Um, and our purpose of this conversation tonight is to integrate our fight with that of more what you would think of as traditionally racial or social justice uh, fights. And so we've brought some incredible people here today. I'm gonna let them each introduce themselves, um, and then I have the one like prompted question, then we'll open it up um, to discussion, any questions that you all want to ask. So if each of you wants to go down and say a little bit about yourself and the um, organization that you're representing this evening. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I'm Merv Tano. Uh, I head up a small law and policy research institute uh, uh, here in Denver called uh, the International Institute for Indigenous Resource Management. We define uh, resource uh, very broadly, everything from coal, oil, air, wind, uh, solar, to uh, genetic uh, and uh, materials and uh, intellectual property. Um, I'm Shantae Farrington. I have two hats today. Um, my first hat, I'm the Colorado State Climate Justice Chair for NAACP um, for Colorado, Montana, and Wyoming. And right now we're looking at kind of changing the um, conversation on climate change and uh, as a racial justice issue. So this is fitting. And um, an example of one of the early campaigns is looking into the effects of coal plants in uh, low-income minority people of color, person of color neighborhoods. Um, um, my other job, I'm a community organizer at First Good Job Strong Communities. Um, so we have four key campaigns that we're working on right now. We're working on the Fair Chance campaign. Is everyone familiar with Ban the Box? You know that question about do you have a criminal background? We want to get rid of that because we don't think that's fair. Um, we're looking for opportunities for our low income people and people of color. We work a lot with unions. We're actually born out of a union. A um, couple of big things on my plate and a couple of my um, colleagues play is the construction around I-70 in that low-income neighborhood GES or Global Village Response Team. Affordable housing, don't know where that is, but Denver is ranked number one place to move to this year in the country, so still trying to figure out how that works. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, minimum wage. Um, we are excited. We're actually in a coalition right now looking to push for that. And so busy, busy time, but we're really looking forward to uplifting families and individuals so they can have a better life. Um, my name is Patrick Kelso, and I'm here representing Showing Up for Racial Justice, which is a national um, organization, and I'm here on behalf of the local Denver chapter, and sort of SURGES, which is the acronym, uh, mission is to um, organize white communities um, against white supremacy and kind of the core values around surge um, includes um, having accountable relationships and taking leadership from organizations of color um, calling in our fellow kind of white communities um, 
in an effort to kind of take responsibility for our own communities and, and weaponize our privilege against white supremacy. Um, and also seeing that we have a mutual interest, which um, definitely connects with this topic really closely, but we have a mutual interest in this struggle. Um, some of the things that we've been working on locally as well as nationally is being involved in um, a lot of the movements against police brutality um, here in Denver, violence from um, the police against communities of color, um, as well as some of the really sort of um, notable national incidents, including Tamir Rice in Cleveland, Mike Brown, Eric Gardner. Um, and then also right now we're mobilizing against um, sort of the Republican platform of xenophobia and racism, um, including coming up on Friday, we have a march towards the other America. This weekend, the Republican um, state convention is happening and Ted Cruz will be here. There was talks that Donald Trump would be here, but I guess he recently pulled out. And so um, at 5.30 on Friday at Union Station, um, we are gonna have a march to kind of show up um, saying that we are calling on the state um, Republicans to denounce this platform of racism and xenophobia. Um, I'd like to introduce myself in my native language first to honor my ancestors and the ancestors that we're all sitting on the lands of, which are the traditional territories of the Arapaho and Cheyenne people. So I'm going to start out by introducing myself. Thank you everyone for being here and present today. My name is Tiffany Lovato. I come from uh, Kiwa Pueblo, which is a tribe in New Mexico. I'm from the Pumpkin Clan and uh, just wanted to thank you all for being here today. Let's give them all a round of applause. at uh, Woodbine Ecology Center and we're uh, a center that promotes indigenous values and sustainable communities. We throw in sustainable communities because we can't talk about just sustainability without all the communities, without all the you community members. Every person in here is part of that community and how do we work together to address some of the issues that are affecting our world and our, our mother earth today. So. That's, uh, I'm the, did I already say what title? I'm an eco-cultural restoration coordinator, and so what my job is to restore our land to a time and a place where there's increase in biodiversity, the soil is uh, recharged, and so is the aquifer. So that's my big thing. So there you go, all this. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Fitting with the title, the first question is going to be simply but also pretty complex. Why for you is climate justice a racial justice issue? And then we'll open it up to questions. So whoever wants to start. I don't want to go first. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, I guess I kind of been struggling with this question because it's such a big one. Kind of my first response was like, like, why, how isn't it, right? Um, and they got a glo in sort of a global, using a global lens, I would say that the two are connected in that sort of the history of white supremacy has created this global crisis, global climate crisis that we're experiencing through colonialism, slavery, and then industrialization, and now sort of globalization and neoliberalism, and sort of this culture and these structures of sort of mass consumption um, and dependency on fossil fuels. Um, these are all historically all structures that have been per perpetuated violence against people of color um, as well as displace them. And so in that sense, they're connected in the cause and I think on a global scale, um, they're also connected in the effects in that because of the way these structures are created, um, it's 
communities of color that are experiencing the brunt of violence created by um, sort of the global climate change. Um, and a term that I have found really useful in thinking about this was um, written by an author named Christian Parenti in his book, Tropic of Chaos, and he calls it catastrophic convergence, and that what's happening isn't just with the climate change, it's the climate change along with the convergence of these systems of violence, right? And so I think a great example of that is um, Hurricane Katrina, right? Um, one of the biggest myths around it is that it was the actual force of the hurricane that created this devastation, when in fact it was the hurricane and it did cause damage, but many people were able to, to get through that process, that, that experience, right? But then it was the levees that, that crushed it, that fell apart, and then this town city got flooded, and just centuries of white supremacy going all the way back to slavery kind of created the landscape of the city to be set up in a way that put um, poor and working class, black communities kind of to experience that, um, that violence as well as that turned the National Guard and the police um, and as well as white paramilitaries um, to turn their guns against um, black people who were trying to find relief in that situation. And I just find that as a really helpful example in, in thinking about this as a catastrophic convergence of systems of racism, um, economic exploitation, um, and how those are merging with sort of these um, environmental issues that are coming up and it's sort of creating the most violence and stress on communities of color. Um, and then the second place that my mind went was just around activism and fighting climate change is, is constructed through white supremacy and it's centered around kind of whiteness and privilege. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of work to be done to kind of deconstruct that and show how racial justice and climate change are connected. And I know that the work that the people are doing on this panel definitely changes that narrative of what is environmentalism, what is environmental activism. Um, and so that's kind of where I started. <coughs> Yeah, um, I'll kind of echo the Katrina example. I see climate justice as kind of a human right issue. Um, looking at Katrina, outside of the levees breaking and all of that, why are our minorities low income living in areas like that? What are those composed of? Typically, they're low income, not a lot of access to resources, and then you end up in these communities where um, you have these big coal plants um, affecting the everyday health of people, that's a human right. Affecting access to resources, that's a human right. Um, we actually did a, um, a, a webinar the other day where in one county in Mississippi, the average median income for African Americans was $25,000. Outside of that, you still had a coal plant in that area. You had like traffic going through. And so to answer this question, it's a little bit difficult, but it's a great question to kind of think about. I see climate justice as a human race issue because it impacts the very things that we need, the necessities that we need to survive. Um, another example that I'll use is we're doing work out at Glover Leary Swansea and anyone knows if you drive through I-70 there's a neighborhood right next to a Purina plant there's a recycling plant I believe there is a um, is there a pork plant or something like that Finery. yeah over there so that smell gets over there trucks go through there and you have families that have been there for years and so that that's not right and with the expansion of the highway it's really going to impact those communities not to mention marijuana is legal and so as uh, uh, property rates go up, you're gonna see a lot of that moving in. Um, an example we heard um, for some people who, do, who would like to stay there, um, they're being outbid because people are coming in with these grow houses and proposing double. And so families are being put out and for the families who stay there and kids who stay there, they have to inhale that and that's not okay either. And so I definitely see climate justice as a racial justice issue and a framework of human rights. You're waiting for me? <laughs> um, I'm Bringy, I'm speaking from an indigenous perspective, being a, from a tribe, being a woman of that tribe, and um, it's very complex as far as uh, racial justice is, is concerned. Not only is race an issue, but also there's the 
the land base that we have. There's uh, the relationship that we have with the federal government that sets us sort of like in, our, in a different lane because we actually have a land base. We have a domestic dependent relationship with the federal government. We have our sovereignty and our status is supposed to be respected and it's a nation to nation. Uh, I wanna stress that a lot of the times there's a lot of language that's put in there that it's a government to government relationship but that's not the case. We are nations. Prior to colonialism coming in, uh, it was a nation to nation building and this was built into the constitution. This has, has built into treaties, traditional territories, legislative acts, Supreme Court decisions all have played a part in how we were able to acquire this land base. And the reservations that currently are spread across all of the United States, they are our homelands. A lot of us got removed from our homelands, but a lot of us remain that original territory. We're still in our ancestral lands. Take my tribe, for example, as Pueblo people, Pueblo Indians, we're there and we've been there. We're actually the con oldest continuous inhabitants of North America. So that sets us way back in time. So I wanted to stress that fact and then also the fact that um, a lot of the, the rights that we fight for is not individual rights as a people. It's, a, it's rights as a community that to recognize our existence that we have a legal right to be there. And yes, yeah, so I want to stress that and how ecology and land were intimately connected in our way of life. We, we don't regard the land as real estate or commodity to be bought, sold, exploited for financial gain. And so that's where I want to stress that. You know, at Woodbine, we talk about indigenous land management because uh, in contrast to popular belief, this this continent was actively managed by indigenous groups. Uh, a lot of the doctrine states that, you know, we came in and it was this pristine wilderness. It was untouched. Nobody touched it at all. That is far from the case. Our people were already here actively managing. And some examples <coughs> I can give you is the oak trees in California. A lot of the tribes in, in California, what they would do is actively um, burn the oak trees in order to clear brush and shrubs and then increase the biodiversity underneath the um, canopy of the oak trees. And so when colonialism came, everybody started saying, this is my land or this is not your land, you know, you're going to go to this reservation. It prompted a lot of the indigenous people to stop having those practices and they could no longer actively manage. You, uh, going back to my tribe, a lot of the the policies that were put in place, they allowed for uh, overgrazing onto our communities. A lot of policies were put into place where uh, documents were forced to uh, decrease land base and also decrease our water rights. So these are some of the issues that we are still facing today. There's a deep connection to that land. And so what about that land is we finally realized that there's resources on that land. I wanted to just point out some of the, a third of all um, low sulfur coal are, uh, in the west is on reservations. Half of uh, North American uranium resources are on reservations. Two thirds of all U.S. copper is in, uh, on res is actually was taken away from the Papago tribe. Their Papago, the Papago tribe in uh, Southwestern uh, Arizona, uh, Southern Arizona actually, uh, they sat on a copper deposit. So of course the United States came in and Congress actually passed the law that declared the land was no longer Papago land. So you see a lot of displacement. In addition to that, a lot of these, uh, I wanted to also point out that uh, a lot of these resources, like I said, a lot of these resources are on reservation land and how many of you have heard of Three Mile Island? Can someone tell me about it? What have you heard? Lady in the Blue. Well, gosh, I think it was probably in the 1980s when the Three Mile Island nuclear plant achieved a meltdown and all the folks in power at that time were in denial of it and the people around the area 
that lived in that area were exposed to high levels of radiation and people who tried to, especially this one woman whose name I forget, who tried to blow the whistle on them was run out of town like most people who try to speak the truth to power and um, she ended up becoming quite a hero in a lot of people's eyes. But yeah, it's, it's one more story of what happens mm -hmm. when, when you have something like nuclear power attempt to keep the kind of consumerist lifestyle that fuels this whole economy. Mm -hmm. And um, from your readings, do you, do you hear that it was the most serious accident in U.S. <laughs> history dealing with nuclear power? Okay, so I wanted to let you guys know um, that actually is false. Uh, Church Rock, New Mexico, Rio Perco uranium mine it was the largest radioactive spill in U.S. history. Not a lot of people know about it because that's on Navajo reservation land. And so you begin to see that <laughs> not only has uh, we have that land base, but we have the resources and there's land grabbing going on and there's a lot of, like what my panelist was saying here is there's a lot of environmental disasters occurring on these on the reservation lands on our territorial lands and so how do we address that so kind of getting into that there's a lot of people that are coming into green solutions you know let's do hybrid vehicles let's install solar array panels or solar panels and where do they put these panels where do they extract these um, sources, resources to get hybrid vehicles. Does anyone know? A lot of it comes from reservation lands, tribal lands. And so uh, that's an important issue is to address is to think about also not uh, further displacing people, not further contaminating their lands, also to think about that when we're thinking about green solution as well. So I think I took up enough time, so thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, as I say, we operate a law and policy research institute. Uh, we work with uh, uh, Indian tribes and organizations, but not in a kind of uh, community way. Uh, we're generally dealing with them around uh, roundtables, seminars, symposia, etc. Uh, so it's kind of come at this at a, at a, different, a different way. So when we talk about, uh, I, I took advantage of my age and gray beard to slightly modify the, the title uh, of the panel, at least my presentation, which is uh, why climate justice is a racial issue. And then in parens, and a few other things as well. Okay. Uh, let me start off by saying that uh, uh, for about three years I was uh, a member of one of the subcommittees of the National Environmental Justice Advisory uh, Committee uh, out, of out of EPA in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, and have been working around environmental justice and justice in, in general for, for a long time. One of the problems I, I think we, uh, we face when we say justice uh, and getting into the notion of, of race and marginalized communities uh, is that we often lapse into the kind of uh, uh, the, the language of distributive justice. Somebody's got more money, somebody's got more water uh, in, their, in, in their basement, somebody's got more carbon emissions, somebody's got fewer, uh, etc. And one of the, the, the difficulties in kind of getting your, your, your arms around that from an uh, indigenous people's perspective uh, is that if we take that distributive uh, justice rhetoric to its, its logical and it's always about somebody doing something for us. 
it's you stopping this, you increasing this, you lessening this. And so ultimately, it comes down to a question of power. Justice, environmental justice, climate justice, uh, is about power. It's about who makes the decisions, how those decisions are being made, uh, the processes uh, by which those decisions are, are, are being made. So if you're at the tail end of that process, then Basically, you're SOL, right? Because the train has left, and now you're left with uh, uh, going to a, uh, a a scoping meeting at uh, for uh, the National Environmental Policy Act, and then you're saying, you know, given these kinds of uh, uh, alternatives, uh, this, you know, this is what we want. This is what we don't want. But generally speaking, when people go to a scoping meeting, for example, to cite a, a, uh, a Lulu, uh, you know, uh, locally undesirable land use, uh, the, the response is no. We don't want, no way in hell do we want this. But everything's stacked against you already because the permits have been, have been uh, issued. The financing is already in, in play. I, I, I'll give you an illustration of that. And it, uh, it's not necessarily a uh, uh, climate justice issue, but it is a justice issue. Uh, who's familiar with the 30-meter telescope issue on Mauna Kea on the Big Island? Okay. So you guys are aware that a, a big hullabaloo, uh, rightfully so, uh, because the University of Hawaii is part of a consortium of uh, international uh, astronomy, uh, institutions, educational institutions, research institutions uh, decided that they were going to construct uh, a huge telescope on a high, on a mountain, Mauna Kea, that was uh, that is absolutely uh, uh, sacred uh, to the uh, Hawaiian people on, on, on many levels. Okay. I, I, I will admit to uh, uh, working uh, in the mid-60s uh, with the uh, astrophysics department at the Hawaii uh, Institute for Geophysics. And uh, at that time, uh, they had one, one observatory up there. And now, there's uh, over a dozen. Okay. Now, I've got friends and colleagues in, uh, in Hawaii who say, but you know, we were here at the beginning of the process, and we were involved, and we engaged with the university and with the TNT people, and they were open and they were transparent, and uh, we support it. And, and basically I'm saying, Richard, you don't quite get it. The die was cast way, way before they had the first hearing, okay. The die was cast when the technology for those segmented mirrors was developed. When it was described at one of the uh, uh, biannual uh, meetings of the National Academy of Sciences Committee for the future of uh, astronomy, right. And there was a guy from Hawaii there. He's, from, he's one of the ex officio members of that, of that committee. And why is he uh, an ex-officio member of that committee? Because they have, they, the university had control, at least they like to think they had control, over that mountain, you see. So he was involved. And if you go through the, 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 the proceedings, uh, reports of those, uh, uh, of those meetings, you can see Hawaii there, but you ain't going to see no Hawaiian issues. You know, Hawaii is mentioned because it's, it's, they've got the, the telescopes there, uh, et cetera. But as far as this guy from the University of Hawaii representing Native Hawaiian uh, concerns, no way. Never occurred to him that he had that obligation. And 
it never occurred to the Hawaiians to tell him and tell the university he had an obligation as well. And therein lies the problem, okay? Because those, those decision-making processes are so removed from, in time, in space, uh, from the day-to-day the, the, the -day concerns of uh, indigenous peoples, of marginalized communities. They only get it after, I mean, get the news. They only get to participate only after the die is cast, as I say. And everything is moving like a juggernaut right down their throats. So the question is, if you're going to get any semblance of justice in this process, then you've got to get into those processes. And that means going beyond notions of divestment, going beyond notions of racial equality, and, and, and demanding, but not only demanding, okay, uh, but also working with your people to get them ready to participate in those kinds of committees. <coughs> Ms. Lovato made a good point of, uh, about uh, tribes as, as, as nations. It's a, it's, a, it's a huge difference because it's not only the land base and the, and the status, it is that they have a, a particular cultural identity, a political identity, they have social networks, and et cetera, okay? So they, they stand as something, uh, as, as more than a, a community. But they also stand uh, in the international arena as subjects of, or, or uh, the uh, UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And so for, for Indian tribes, Indian nations, uh, other uh, uh, indigenous uh, uh, peoples, I think it's worthwhile not only to uh, look at this as uh, you know, uh, uh, a racial equality issue, but to look at uh, the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People to see how proposals uh, for development, uh, uh, the, the, the absence of uh, uh, indigenous participation or minority participation uh, in the decision-making process squares with the principles of the UN Declaration of, uh, for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So let, let, let me stop there, and then uh, we can talk story later. That's a great start of the conversation. Um, we'll open it up for questions now. Um, and of a specific member of the panel, or generally, um, feel free to raise your hand. I can throw one out there. Okay. Um, so, uh, we've been talking a lot about, um, and this is more geared towards um, our synergy panelists. But, um, and then opening it up to everybody. The conversation around hashtag Black Lives Matter I think is really transformative in the way that we see environmental justice. Um, would you both be able to speak to that a little bit and how we frame um, something that we've seen so publicly as the Black Lives Matter movement um, within something like environmental justice and how those two might, in the words of Patrick, converge? Um. A good question. <laughs> when I think like about the Black Lives Matter movement or any, I think not even Black Lives Matter, but like yeah, Latino populations, but in this case, of Black Lives Matter as well, um, I think it's a question of equity over equality. Um, oftentimes, we find ourselves with this um, argument of well, everyone should be treated the same, then we'll all get there. But it's a lot more than that, right? Um, so. A lot of us don't have opportunities that other people had, whether they be growing up or access to resources in that sense. And I think that the Black Lives Matter and connecting that to a climate justice issue gets to kind of what um, my organization, Fresh, also gets at is kind of those um, lack of resources in a way or access to resources thereof to help kind of boost people out of their current situations. Um, perfect example. Um, uh, 
remember she talked about like uh, displacement. You talk think about gentrification. You have these minority mm -hmm. neighborhoods where money's going in, and they use this fancy word called urban renewal. That's just a fancy word for gentrification to me. Mm -hmm. um, and they fix them up knowing that the um, people there cannot afford to live. They actually fix it up after this vision. And oftentimes this happened in minority, low income and people of color neighborhoods, and it happened time and time again. Um, this displacement comes when people are being pushed out because that money going to that neighborhood to renew it, and then where where does everyone go? You know, there's got to be a end stop after the airport. Um, there was actually a study where six percent of African Americans are unaccounted for in Colorado. We do not know what happened to that population, and that's not okay. Um, so, in the context of Black Lives Matter, I think it's kind of a voice, a equal, a equity voice in the process and the decisions that are affecting us. Um, <clears throat> kind of where my mind goes is before I got involved in showing up for racial justice I was organizing for several years with um, the Student Farm Worker Alliance which works in solidarity with the Coalition of Immokalee Workers which is a farm worker organization from Florida that goes and calls on like fast food companies for um, more better wages basically and actually they just called boycott the other week on Wendy's and so I encourage you all to check that out and support that um, but something I learned that had a really profound effect on me was when when these farm worker organizers would go to conferences on sort of like slow food on sustainability they would ask the question um, sustainability for who right and that's a question that's kind of stayed with me that I continually to go go back to where I think about Flint, Michigan, right? So let's say that tomorrow we wake up and there's been this sudden change where there's gonna be no climate crisis, we have energy that isn't fossil fuels and everything is great and wonderful, but is it sustainable for um, a poor black community in Flint, Michigan to live there when the water supply has been poisoned, right? Like that's unsustainable, it's unsustainable like what you brought up with gentrification, living in the neighborhood that you grew up in is it's no longer sustainable to live there. So when we talk about sustainability, um, sustainability for who, right? And I think that's a question um, that relates to the Black Lives Matter movement where it's when we ask about, when we talk about sustainability, well, like sustain, is this sustainable for, for the black community? Um, do black lives matter in, in this where um, and Flint, I think, is a great example of where those things intersected as well as like what I brought up earlier um, with New Orleans and Hurricane Katrina. So, um, yeah. Can, can I comment on, on that? Yeah. I, uh, you know, your discussion about food, I, I, I think, is, uh, uh, is, is right on. Uh, and, and again, it, it, it kind of reinforces this notion uh, that things happen not because they're in our backyard. Things happen because decisions are being made. In Rome, for example, with the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization that periodically issues, uh, what's that, the uh, underutilized and, uh, I'm sorry, uh, something, uh, foods, uh, grains, uh, which is how quinoa got elevated in the uh, eyes of uh, of the world, okay, and and, and so every year or, or, or so uh, they, they have this report on, and the, the idea then is to uh, because it's it's sustainably grown and consumed and produced in in Bolivia or in, in or in Kenya, etc. Uh, the notion somehow is that uh, the the worldwide worldwide expansion of this is going to be good for everybody. But not necessarily for the growers in Kenya or the growers in, in Bolivia. And, and therein lies the problem. And because the slow food guys have got access to FAO in Rome. They're going to the meetings. Okay. But, but the local folks generally have to rely on NGOs to, to eventually uh, get the word to them. And, and the idea 
that I think uh, that supports justice is to to get the folks prepared to be at those decision making uh, places, so. uh, which which is like in a sense Black Lives Matter because somebody made a decision that we were going to somehow rid the streets of New York of this pernicious, absolutely dangerous uh, crime of selling Lucy's. Okay. Notwithstanding, the guys in the towers are, are ripping off billions of dollars. And this poor son of a bitch is making a buck and a half on, 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 a, on a pack of cigarettes. They're going to kill this guy and let the other guys go uh, because our attorney general, our, our uh, you know, our, our president seeks not to go after these guys, and, and it's that disparity of power in those places of power, and and so you can say uh, Black Lives Matter, but ultimately Black Lives don't matter to the guys who people who are making those decisions. For the people who say, we need community policing, which is a good idea, right? At least, sounds good. Uh, you know, a broken window will lead to uh, uh, anarchy. Uh, so we have community uh, policing. But what that means is somebody made the decision, not necessarily the community made the decision, not necessarily Latinos or, uh, or or, or, or black members of the community made the decision. It was somebody else that made the decision that we're going to have community policing. And what that does, it results in this overwhelming presence, this overweening presence of, of the, uh, law enforcement that is just primed to you know, that's, uh, you know, bring the community to heal. So, so, yeah, it's a racial equality thing. It's, uh, it's equity, but it's also this, you've got to go to see where, where the power, you know, how did this thing happen and where the power structure uh, is kind of located and how that power structure made those decisions. I wanted to um, comment, just piggybacking off of some of his comments as he just seeing, uh, actually I saw this cool video just recently on Facebook with Black Lives Matter getting in uh, solidarity with Native Lives Matter movement. And it was just so, it was uplifting. It's just amazing to see two groups get together and just support each other in that way. And I've seen justice, I mean, he's talking about the policy making, but I've seen it come also at a grassroots level all communities coming together in so many innovative ways everything from um, restorative justice addressing that inter addressing intergenerational and generational traumas there's also uh, direction direct action movements that have been led by all of our groups um, take for example the Dakota Access Pipeline we have a lot of support with that from all different groups also another thing is uh, you're talking about food uh, uh, food sovereignty is very important in many of our communities what I've seen coming up is so many innovative ways seeing urban gardens in so many communities to address these um, inequalities, being able to provide food. I've seen guerrilla movements of food grafting or tree grafting to get fruit trees into the communities. I've seen uh, seed bombing, all these different creative ways and creating, uh, it's, it's addressing some of those issues. Also, I see in all many communities that food renewal of, of especially in indigenous communities, because so much was taken away. So there's uh, there's that renewal, that cultural reawakening and continuance of our ways. So I just wanted to address that because I've just seen so much of our groups get together in, in so many ways and to address these justice issues. So. I think they had a question. Yeah. Yeah, um, this is questions for Tiffany and Murph, but everyone jump in. Um, many of the most powerful uh, um, influential direct actions have been uh, being led by um, indigenous communities. 
um, in terms of the Keep in the Ground campaigns and just the climate justice movement in general. Um, I'm just wondering how uh, you see um, these environmental groups being better uh, as standing as allies in solidarity with these frontline communities, um, and what is the role of in supporting? That is a wonderful question, and so much is brought up about how um, the fact of consultation and actually listening to these communities. A lot of these individuals come into these communities and um, they don't really listen to what the people have to say. So I first, that's the first suggestion I say is even with working with the federal government, working on policies and such, I always say consultation is so important. Listen to the communities and then come in and whatever resources you have, I mean, let's get together and make change happen. I mean, that's the short, <laughs> short version. <laughs> A, a comment, on, if I could, please. Uh, I'm, I'm a firm believer in, in public participation, cons consultation, etc. Uh, one of the problems I, I, I see uh, is that there is, in a sense, a kind of uh, uh, cultural primacy. Uh, in the in these discussions, and it's really hard. Uh, it, it's doable, but you got to really work at it. Uh, to, to have, for example, federal program managers, land managers, etc., uh, to understand that by way of illustration, okay. Uh, I, I did a presentation on uh, at uh, at UNESCO uh, uh, er, late last year, and, and the presentation was entitled uh, "Why It Should Be You Know Worst of the Effect." Why it should be about integrating uh, traditional knowledge systems? Or, I'm sorry, uh, Western science with traditional knowledge systems, and not the other way around, because because so much of the kinds of consultation around traditional knowledge, around uh, uh, cultural uh, issues, uh, uh, religious issues uh, uh, that takes place around NEPA processes, uh, uh, forest management plans, sets up this, this uh, paradigm where it is, is, is obviously a, a superior position versus an inferior position. Uh, that is, the Western biologists has to pass on this mythology, the stories, the folklore, the anecdotes of native peoples and, 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 and their traditional resource management uh, uh, practices before it's validated, you see. And it's gotta be the other way around. Uh, you gotta have, the, 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 in this case, the tribes, uh, Alaska, say, We've been doing this, as you point out, for thousands of years. We're evolving, and you can help us evolve, but God, God, you know, keep your condescending bullshit uh, out of this discussion. You know, and, and that's that's a that's a justice issue, right? Now the, the other thing is. And it's easy to say, keep it in the ground. And God bless you for, for working on it. But somebody's got to figure out what it's going to mean to have transport in this country electrified. And if it ain't us, it's going to be somebody else. It's going to be RAND, it's going to be a DOE contractor, and they won't have a foggiest notion of what our interests are. See, so again, here's, you got to proceed to my way of thinking uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a broad front. You can't just say, we got to stop, for example, Keystone XL pipeline or, or stop the, uh, the tar sands up in uh, uh, Alberta. Gr granted, I mean, I, I understand why we should do that. 
But in the meantime, somebody's got to be saying, hey, what is it going to mean if the railroads are electrified? What is it going to mean if we have electric vehicles? Who's going to, who's going to be pumping out all of those electrons? Uh, is it going to harm us? Is it going to uh, help us, etc.? So, just wanted to add that. Did that answer your question, sort of? Yeah, no, it's really nice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, mine's kind of similar. Um, I, I've heard a lot about, um, well, what I'm hearing here is that when you ask the question sustainable to whom, or sustainable in what way, it always comes down to how does it affect people right here, right now. In other words, its local impacts have to be taken into account. And most of the big institutions, their clients are worldwide. That's who they're trying to, to appease. So the question that I keep hearing needs to come up is, so how are the negative impacts of climate change going to be helping the people here? And now I, that gets back to the divestment issue. Is the money that would be divested from the petroleum it, uh, uh, companies going to be then instead invested in the local institutions or the local communities in which they live? For example, DU comes to mind. What it, is DU going to be, in many ways, acknowledging the impact of, of oil on the worldwide uh, uh, especially the poor people in the world, and making a renewed commitment to helping the communities right here with regard to the climate change, whether you're talking about the, 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 the causes of climate change being the, the, the colonial mindset, but certainly the impacts of climate change being on poor communities. So I just want to know where this divestment thing is going. Are we actually going to be more proactive then in carrying out some of the things we're hearing here? And not just divesting, but investing where it needs to be done. That's the goal. We have a board of trustees meeting um, next, or meeting with the board of trustees next week in order to talk to them about our case for divestment and the plans for the future. So I don't know if there's much conversation. That. But we are, we were supposed to end at um, 7 technically, we started late, yeah. but if Kayla wants to ask the last question and then we'll yeah. one more right here, she has a lady's been had her yeah, hand up for the long, <laughs> <laughs> longest <laughs> time too. We'll go Kayla yeah. and then down in the front, cool. Uh, hi, my name is Kayla, um, and my question for you is, um, in my four years of being at the university, I've really struggled to bring the African American community and the environmental community together because a lot of times you see that yet yeah, for a lot of the African American community they don't see quite the implications of the environmental movement. It's more of a hippie movement. They don't see that those two are combined. Um, and then on the other side there's a lot of, you know, we have our own environmental movements that may not go directly into social justice. So I just want to know how would you best suggest to educate people and bring together just kind of like what this is event this event is doing, but working to show that those two are really together and they affect each other, um, and hopefully have a movement not just Black Lives Matter, but bringing in together some of those environmental movements and showing that it is all one. What have you tried? I'm curious, and I'm I'm willing if it's a long story. I'm willing to connect with you offline. That's cool. Um. Well, I think because I. I Black Student Alliance, but I also do a lot in the environmental community, so just being that person, I do try to involve both groups, but sometimes it's really hard with when you have, for example, the environmental community, that they have stuff that they really have to focus on within that and saying with the black community. So a lot of times, and I just think that's with groups in general, it's hard to get a crossover because everybody is stuck in the specific topic that they're trying to fix versus seeing the bigger picture. I agree, and it's not hard to find that connection. It's just you have to be kind of open to doing it. So the NLACP actually, we partner with the Sierra Club, and so we do this series of healing hunts. We actually have one coming up in like a month or so, which I just realized I have to win, so it's awesome. Um, <laughs> and the overall goal is to get minorities more invested in the environment, and so what we do is we have a group of people, largely minorities, and we go out to a specific area and do like a hike. 
nothing intense. This isn't conundrum. I'm not going to do a 16 mile hike in 90 yard field. Um, but throughout this hike, you ask social justice questions. So, for example, at um, one of the hikes, we ended up hiking about, I want to say about half a mile. Then we got to this beautiful scenery of like a lake in the mountains. And then you just need, got like two minutes to reflect on how you're involved in the social justice movement and as a minority. And if you didn't really have a good answer, then we need to figure that out. That means you have to keep walking until you find out <laughs> why. <laughs> At the end of it, we connected you to nature and you have a commitment to do another healing hike and bring more people involved in it because there are a lot of minorities involved in the environment. And I'm from North Carolina. We have water. This is Colorado. No way. And I don't like relying on snow for water. Okay? But I love it here. I just want to put that out there, Charlie. <laughs> um, so, yeah, just got to find creative ways to make that connection. And I'm willing to connect with you after that to kind of go over that with you if you're interested. Yeah, and um, I like to bring in that community perspective. Going back to many years in college, a long time ago, um, going back to then, we, we got ourselves immersed into the community. Once you immerse yourself into the community, you bring these two together, it seems like, ah, oh, it makes sense now. I mean, uh, small examples I can give is uh, uh, Woodbine Ecology Center works with um, various groups here, Denver <coughs> Indian Center, uh, also uh, a lot of the per permaculture groups. And so one of the groups that we've been working with is Mo Beta Greens, and it's an urban, um, urban gardening started by um, Bev Beverly and so uh, she's making or she's building an urban garden right near um, Park Hill have you heard of that garden mm -hmm. it's over in Park Hill and so that's one way to get involved too is to bring everybody together because you have a permaculture grill that it's predominantly um, um, white folks it's a lot of permaculture people but then if we bring in the whole community and we're there together and all our mission is is how do we make greens in this community? How do we br bring good stuff to this community? Because there's so many food deserts within this city. And so how do we start addressing those? And so you start seeing together that when you get involved in the community, start understanding those issues that they can very well merge together. So it's just one small example that I have. <laughs> yeah, let's take that last yeah, question. So I actually grew up in Hawaii, which is why I knew about the 30 meter telescope. Um, and they're a big obstacle to their sovereignty, um, other than you know trying to work that obviously within their community, um, as well as with the federal government, is the large military presence that's on the islands, especially on Oahu. Um, I think they own like a third of that island. Um, so I was just wondering if you guys had any thoughts on the role of the military or even military weaponry being used in police forces, um, that sort of thing, and how that affects community, uh, I guess marginalized communities, as well as uh, the fight for climate change, uh, against climate change. Oh. Uh, <laughs> good there's question. A, there's a professor uh, up at, uh, he's out of uh, Washington State. What's that, uh, Gene? That, that college up there. Uh, Is that Evergreen? Evergreen. Uh, he's taking a sabbatical uh, and uh, he's going to be working with some of the community activists, uh, anti military folks. Uh, I don't know if you know people like uh, Kyle Kajahiro, et cetera. But uh, he's going to be working with them uh, during a sabbatical to, to come up with strategies and write some, do some writing on uh, uh, how you get rid of the, uh, of the military. Okay. Uh, now, long term, I don't mind that as a goal. All right. Short term, what the, the native community has been reluctant to do has been to dance with the devil. Okay. Because you say, you, you go to the big islands, Pohakaloa uh, training area, huge lands, Helicopters, uh, ospreys, uh, uh, all, all these, not the osprey, the nice birds, osprey, those uh, horrible, noisy uh, uh, rotor things. Uh, so, you've got, on Kauai, you, you've got uh, bases on 
on Oahu, uh, uh, Schofield Barracks, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Lots and lots of prime land. But somebody's got to be the one who is working with those guys around integrated natural resource management plans, around integrated cultural resource management plans. The community folks have got to be there. Uh, they've got to be weigh in on all the, the NEPA uh, processes. Because ultimately, you, you've got to be in a position to almost co-manage those lands. Uh, and you also have to be ready for the, the, the whole process, the next uh, round of base realignment and closures. Because Native folks are always a you know day late and dollar short on these BRAC uh, uh, closures, and so they never get the uh, chance to glom onto those lands. When, when in Hawaii they should have priority to get those surplus military lands, but they got to get their stuff in order. They got to have all their stuff lined up about what they're going to do for the development. They got to have a development corporation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all ready to go, and it's. This is the kind of stuff that's really hard for indigenous peoples, whether they're in Hawaii or uh, uh, continental U.S., uh, to, to kind of put together the, net, the necessary human capital and, and the financial uh, wherewithal to put these kinds of things in place. Uh, it's a long-term proposition, because as long as uh, we have aspiration, we the U.S. has aspiration to be the, the world's uh, sole hyperpower. They're going to have Pearl Harbor. Um, real quick, um, that just made me think, going back to the book, Tropic of Chaos by Christian Print, the, um, is he talks about how we're with sort of this converging catastrophe, we're becoming more and more of an armed lifeboat society where more and more there's going to be struggles and kind of moving towards for resources and more and more we're seeing kind of like military and um, just like other weaponry systems being keeping people out of resources and so um, I think an example of that is in Europe with the immigration crisis that's happening and kind of these closed borders that are happening um, I don't have any strategy for you in terms of getting rid of the military, but I found that to be like a helpful um, sort of theory. And then I also just want to take a second and address your question and just say that um, as a white person who's involved in environmentalism, that um, myself and all of us white people involved in environmentalism have a lot to do in terms of dealing with our own internalized racism and as Murph put it, condescending bullshit. Um, <laughs> it's a technical term, you understand? Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that um, I think this is another intersection of racial justice and sort of like dealing with climate change and that if we're going to be successful in this, we need to build these coalitions and these coalitions will not be built if we can't deal with our own internalized racism. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you all for your commentary. We have little gifts from all of the audiences. We have to thank all of the organizations that put this together. I want to thank all of you all for coming out tonight. Um, we really appreciated it. I know it ran a little long, so thank you for staying. Um, as well, if you want to receive updates from any and all the orgs that um, put together and keep putting this on, um, we have sign-in sheets out front if you didn't get those. There's a ton of kind bars, so take some home with you. Um, one of my roommates is a kind bar rep, and we have like 400 in our house, so like go take 10 and it'll be fine. Um, yeah, so thank you all again. Oh, and, and an announcement. Uh, on my Facebook page, I have several uh, uh, groups. One is climate stuff, and the other lots of energy stuff, and things like that. So if you're interested in in uh, keeping up with uh, some of the current literature, uh, it's there. Yeah. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Anyone open for higher wages? Mm -hmm. Ooh, no. <laughs> um, so um, next 
Thursday April 14th, we're going to have a Fight for 15 action downtown. And so we're going to expect about 500 people. And so if you're interested, um, let me know. And um, I wanted to make a plug for an uh, event coming up. We recently had four of our representatives go to D Detroit for the uh, Solidarity Economy. There's going to be a report back on April 30th over at Posner Center at 6 p.m. on April 30th. So I would love to see you guys there. This is Gene Rubin, our general counsel and also director of our uh, film fest. Oh, film events? Yeah, the, the one on energy coming yeah, up. Yeah, we have... Um, we have an indigenous film, monthly indigenous